time, it's marketing thing, idea. Native ones you see around the, um, 
uh, Grand Creek, some of those, those, a lot of those are right there. So it really adapts well for a clay soil. So if you want bright color, easy to care for, low water, this is probably one of the better ones. Uh, that one and this one right here, the kind of companion. You've seen this one bloom, just to tease you into the class. This one's been in bloom for at least two months. This is a desert willow. And so it has a bright flower that says it's going to hummingbirds absolutely love this plant. It's one of their favorites. It's one of their main ones that they'll feed off of. And so it'll bloom like this over and over and over until fall, usually by the end of this month. Kind of mid-October, it's kind of done blooming. It turns this bright gold color. It tends to be more vase-shaped natively. I have been able to train them up into a miniature tree. Uh, but they tend to turn into a lollipop looking thing. So if you like the Dr. Seuss look, that's pretty good. They tend, they tend to be smaller, maybe mid teens, no more than 20 feet, so they tend to pop out and equally as wide. Generally in the wild, they just have kind of this beautiful multi stem base shaped plant. It just blooms like this over and over. A little insider tip for this plant after it gets done blooming, it will form a bean pot, the true native one. If you pick that bean off, it will go right back into bloom again. You can cause it to bloom two or three or four times just by picking the beans off. The newer varieties that we're bringing in, we've got two new varieties coming in. We've actually bred that bean out of there that so doesn't form a bean, so you don't do, you don't do any work. And so it naturally it's just, once you get some blooming, we bloom again because it's never focused in on forming those seeds inside the bean. It just blooms and blooms. And it's got a little bit deeper, richer color to it. So with desert willows, these are great. What I do with these, I'll put them on my drip system. I'll fertilize them like crazy until they get up to size. Then I cut them off of all further care. That's done. You're done. You will never have me prune you or take care of you. You're on your own. Go and thrive and bloom for me every year. Uh, it's that tough. Because it's a native. It's one of our local, yokel. Up and down to Dewey, over towards Skull Valley. They're everywhere along the side of the road. It's a great plant. These guys grow well. This is more of a shade tree. If you want shade along that side patio, a west wall, this is the one you want to go with. If you want just an accent tree out there in the yard or a pollinator on the back fence line, this is probably better choice. Actually, I do think butterflies use this as a food source sometimes. But, but really, Pollinate, pollinators you think of as flowers, nectars, that kind of stuff. Anyway, those are two just to kind of teach you into the, into the class. And then back over. Of course, it's just water over something. But they're maximum weight. Here we go. So, where do we begin this thing? Again, I just came off the airplane late last night. I'm covering from Michelle. Michelle caught the last couple, but I'll take it. So, uh, trees. You got evergreens. You have flowering trees. That's your uh, purple, the uh, um, like the desert willows. Uh, it'd be crab apples. It'd be red buds. We've got blooming trees. Uh, we've got shade trees. And then you got fruit trees. There are really four main categories that we sell here. You'll get all congregated. Got evergreen trees with juniper, pine, spruce, firs, cedars, and cypress. Then you've got your shade trees with maples and aspens, and ash, all these bigger trees that get pretty large and mostly they have fall color as well. Then you've got your uh, fruit trees, apples, and pears, and cherries, and peaches, and nectarines. Uh, but we grow a lot of different fruits here. And then your blooming trees, they kind of start the season out. And I'll give you a handout. I should probably do that. I'll do that after this. Uh, it's your, your crab apples and red buds, uh, desert willows. There's all these flowering trees that do well. Generally, they're going to be deciduous. Deciduous means they lose their leaves. There's either deciduous or there's evergreen. So those are the two types. All, all of your fruit trees are deciduous. You don't grow citrus here. The elevation is just too high, so in the winter they just die off. Citrus will go down to that mid 20s. If you go to 22, 21, 19, which we do every winter, 
they're going to die. They just obliterate them. Uh, we're going to have to teach you to got metrics and apples at the very top. They'll go down to minus 20, minus 40 degrees, something we never, ever see. And so when you're researching your trees, look at that zone that they're ready for. Because we have a lot of influence coming up out of the desert. You'll see these trees coming up. Like I saw Costco. Um, look online. You can buy them right now. Uh, so you saw Costco with avocados. That is, such, that is such a disservice. We should not be selling that in our market. That's the Phoenix market. That's the Tucson market. That's the lower desert market. But the buyer just says, ship 50 of those every one of my stores and make it happen. They're just after the revenue. They don't care whether you're successful or not. They just want the revenue. And so you got to be able to do a little bit of homework. I see that a lot with fruit trees. Um, they'll bring in a, something, a, a, kind of a desert variety. So they're tricked into blooming too soon here. So they'll be in bloom February, March. Uh, and if they, they see frost at that point, they'll take the blossom, they'll take the fruit. But you need to make sure that you're getting late blooming uh, fruiting varieties. If you're into apples or pears or whatever that is, make sure you get one of this, this as many chill hours as you can. Or you just come by at the right place, like Water Garden Center. So we only carry local varieties that are that are kind of proven. Just be aware, just do your homework, because you're seeing that influence from the desert up here. Oh, a lot of our garden content comes from the U of Ed. That's our ag extension school. Well, not everything that the farmland uses down there migrates up to here, since I've heard we've a little bit. And definitely the plants are different from there. They can grow a few of them, but not very many. Pretty much if you're from Scottsdale, Palm Springs, kind of the, the hard desert, the hot desert, just kind of erase everything you know, reboot and start over. It's kind of because none of that garden information works up here. So that's well, that's why you're here to class too. So with that, I said I was going to give you a couple things. I've got two handouts. We're going to go over and I'll send these to you digitally this afternoon. So we try to always give you something, so if you miss the notes, you can go right back to it. So give me your email address right there if that's of interest. If you don't know this, just, just, just that five out. I've got the top 10, let's throw up it here, top 10 list. It doesn't tell you anything about them, it just shows you the top 10 fruit trees, top 10 shade trees, top 10 fall colored trees, top 10 blooming trees. It's the top 10. There's probably 40 or 50 of them that we sell, but these are the most popular. And from there, you can go research. And then we're going to go deep into how to water a plant. This is our plant together. It just shows you all the things, all the products, how much of each product, uh, how big the hole should be, all the specs you really want to have on, OK, landscape or gardener, plant it. No, it's not deep enough. Plant it deeper. It needs to be a wider. So then you can go talk or just put, spend the time on making sure that it's punted right. And this really does work for us very, very well. So those are the two handouts I thought was appropriate for, for this particular class and hold it right in. And we'll, we'll put the uh, links in for you all. If you could, it's really helpful is just while you're tuned in, how many can we have online, Jen, you know? Uh, it's dropped off for some reason. We started out with 10 and now it's down to six. Uh, well, up your so, game. I know, I'll do a dance, there we go. <laughs> Uh, if you could, if you like what you're seeing, if you make a comment, if you click on the links, it helps us link better because little guys don't have the ad budget, just pay for Google to show us off. It really helps the little guys kind of keep up with the big boys if you interact in that comment field. But we'll put these links in there for you all too. There's a question right here. Yeah, you mentioned the top 10 and they were based on the most popular. Yeah. What's your feeling about the most popular versus what you would recommend? So, so the question was, just for you both over here too, uh, top 10 and most popular, what's my feel on, if, if they didn't perform well, they would be allowed on the list. These are things that have just proven over and over and over. They work. Red buds are on the list. Red buds are a native, blooming, shorter tree. We sell hundreds. Uh, now we have which variety of red bud? I don't care. Pick one. They're all the same. They all do well. Which variety of crab apple? I don't care. They're all the same. Pick your favorite color you like. So there's some of that. Maples. Maples are maples. 
There's some that are better with meat scares, so we try to focus in on those and name them out. But just follow the list. So it be, the, the fruit trees are the named varieties that bloom the latest. Dane cherry, Utah giant. We're trying to name them out. We're trying to make it easier for you. And then our website is tremendous. Uh, this, all the products that we're talking about today, all the plants, they're on our website. You can see how much it costs, size it is, description, what's on our what's on our signage is right there. Even more, so zone. We're trying to be as detailed as we can so that you can just name it for research. Today. And I guess the number one phone call I get here at the garden center is laborious. I never want to answer again, do you have a plan? Go the website, go the website, go to the website, don't ask me, don't call me. I know you've got a phone, but I don't have the staff to answer the phone, go to our website, our website. It's really cut down a labor piece so people can just research it. And the architectural landscapers use a lot. So you're not saying they got it. But yeah, they got labor to ask for oh, all six. So help them out. So the website's really a good resource for you. All right, you derailed me now. I'm going to answer. Front row, what is this? Yeah, go ahead. Are they low water? Very low water. Yeah, they're, they're, red buds are very low water. What's established? Okay, so I love boating. That's my thing. Uh, I love house boating. I love house boating on Lake Powell. And so every guest that comes up to the lake, you have to take them to the big arch that's up there. Mid Lake, huge rainbow bridge. If you hike up there, it's about a mile hike, you'll see this huge, the largest natural arch in the world, right there, in our own backyard. And you've got to go 50 miles to get to it, the only way to get to it. And so you go hike a mile, and then you can hike to the back side of it. And the back side of this rainbow bridge is a beautiful Arizona red bud, or Mexican red bud. It's got several names, or Western red bud. They're all the same. It's beautiful. It's got to be 15, 20 feet tall. Stunning, a little bit smaller leaf, but it's beautiful. Natively growing there. So yes, I would call it out and say, that's pretty harsh up there. That's about as harsh as you get, but it's growing right here wild. So yeah, you're gonna kill that one, it'll be over water. Yeah. Okay. What? Overwatered. Oh, over water. Yeah. So com so easy to do this time of year. When the monsoons are in, that's when you kill things. It's March, August and September, that's when you kill things. Because March has this heavy, heavy place. Uh, we got this heavy place soil with these snows that just sit there and they slowly melt and they turn the soil into goo. Now, by the time you're done with this event, it's been three weeks, and literally the plant's roots will rot off the, underneath it. So you see a lot of damage in the spring. Usually, you can recover with a little bit of a few tricks that can help you get it to re root. It's harder to recover from this time of year. The monsoon's hit and your irrigation is still going like it's June, hot and dry. You're going to get some depth of decay or damage or stress. And the stress looks like yellow leaves start to drop, they get spots on them, they just drop off. That's almost always this time of year from overwatering, not underwatering. You, got to, you almost have to play with your clock and adjust it every once in a while. Or I've got. Uh, Anymore, you get these satellite-driven clocks. You've got to be a rocket scientist, and engineers, and your accountants, your nurses. You're technical about these, working these numbers, but but once you get them honed in, they're pretty accurate. It's pretty amazing how they adjust the clocks and stuff. Now the new tech coming out. I think the next generation is really going to be a game changer. Right now, they're still learning with our backyard. They're gathering that data. I'm sure trying to figure it out. We'll, we'll change it later. Okay, I didn't need to go down to irrigation, but there we go. So you got the four kinds: evergreens, you got fruit trees, flowering trees, and shade trees. Uh, we'll go over some of those. So you got this one is maple. This is a shade tree. It's a native. It grows wild, bright orange color. This is a sensation maple. I don't know if it's on the top 10 list. Kind of the native folks, they kind of, they're really specialized. So um, it's harder to sell native stuff. But I think we can cross over just to be this popular. Every yard has pretty much, it's that, it's that good. 
especially if these yards are getting smaller and smaller. You got a smaller backyard, smaller side patio. This is a far better tree than this maple. This is a this is the most popular maple ever. And this is called Prescott Blaze Maple or Autumn Blaze Maple. Let's let the folks online. Is that too close to the camera? <laughs> Here is way more fun. Uh, anyway, this is autumn blaze. This turns bright, bright, blazing red in the fall of the year. Usually October one or so. This will be bright. Not quite turning yet, but that it's still sitting out. We grow. But here, another two, three weeks, it'll start to turn, and then it'll just be this bright, like fire engine red. Like people will stop on the road and go, oh, "What is that kind of red?" The beauty with this one is a lot of red maples, like Acer Reprum. Or your red maples from the Midwest, that's the most popular there. It's a slow growing hardwood. But the wind, their wind tends to tear up the leaves and it makes it look pretty ratty after a time. This one is less prone to leaf tear, but looks better. You still get some, you get some really strong winds come spring, uh, but less of it. And then it's the fastest growing of the red maples. This will grow three, four feet a year. This is all new growth. This is here. I mean, it'll grow that much. So you can go small and go, it's going to be big in three years. So every home I've ever had, I've had one of these out by the front yard. It's the shade, the big tree, 35 by 20. It's a big, it's truly a shade tree. The blaze maples are great. You know, and the other shade, just to show you the shade, shade trees. These two are related. This is the biggest. This is probably the most native. This is a, a the Desto ash, which is related to our Arizona ash, one that grows wild. Um, in fact, I can't tell the difference between the two. This one grows in the hotter ranges of California, New Mexico. Ours grows in Arizona. I think they're the same tree. This is, turns up. Uh, this gets up maybe 20 feet tall and about 15, 18 feet wide. It's kind of a lollipop looking thing, rounded shape. Good shade tree, very robust, very hardy, drought hardy. I would say it's very low care. Its color, though, is bright gold like an aspen. But it's an aspen gold color. This one is its cousin, also an ash, called raywood ash. Raywoods are big trees. If you want a, just a big old shade tree, this is going up to 35, 40 feet tall. And kind of, again, a lollipop. It maybe it's got a point on it. It really is pretty round. It's just so tall. You don't see the point. It just looks round. Big, distinctive trunk to it. Very much a tree. Uh, but the smaller leaves of these two trees make it more efficient. It doesn't perspire as easy. It's more efficient on uh, the way that it works with the moisture. And it just has a big root system. So, Raywood is famous in the fall because it turns bright purple. We must have just gotten this one in. So, it's like a uh, bright, I mean, like true, like. Deep, rich, purple. It's really, really great. You put this with a gold color, oh, it's really great. You kind of mix and make this make this color go into it. If you need some shade, that's a good one. Those are all the shade trees that we have. This gets up to, I would say, 30 feet wide, 35 feet tall. Because it's dimension. So, yeah, it's a big boy. It's going to go way beyond a couple stories. So what kind of dimension would you get on the sensation button? Sensation's going to be smaller, and you'll have to keep up. I've already told that one. You said smaller, but not how You're about 20 feet. You'll have to keep up. By, well, it's got some size, uh, but it's not as big as tiny little bit. And this will be placed with you, that is. Okay, now we go to flowering trees. A couple of examples. They're just the most popular ones. I mentioned red buds. I don't have any of those right now because those are a spring blooming thing. I run out of those crops. So that the red bud is of, is of interest to you, grab them when they're in bloom. They're one of the first things to bloom in spring. And by the middle to the end of spring, I'm out. The crop turns into a lemon crop. 
This tree right here, this is a purple leaf palm. This tree is about Cool. Well, I'm just left thing right there. Um, this tree formed about the same time as a red bud, maybe a little bit earlier. It depends on the print. As a, as a purple, uh, kind of no foliage, just all pink flowers in the spring, usually in the month of March. Uh, and then it has this purple foliage to it. As it turns color, it can get a little bit more purple, a light orange color to it. It's quite pretty, but it's just purple. It's this color kind of year round. You can overdo it and get too much purple. Sometimes you need some green to go with it, but a lot of folks, this is, this is a top solo. Short. So this gets maybe, I don't know, low teens, about 18 feet by 12 feet wide. Usually it's a base shape, base shape kind of, kind of formation to it. And it can put on little tiny cherry like fruits. About every other year, it seems like it gets these little fruits. It's the bird's love. But it's right out there, but it makes good jam. There, 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 it's got a real sweet inside, tart outside, so I can see that. Uh, but if it's fine, if you're not into, into jams and jellies and that kind of stuff, and it's by a sidewalk, it'd be nothing but loosens. So there you'd be better off than with choke cherry, which is the same plant pretty much without the fruit. But this is a number one seller because there's so many of them around. And trying to get people off of these on the choke cherries, which I think is a better choice, is less maintenance, longer lived, just get the shock hold, but this is a number one seller. So the short flowering tree. Boy, I've not been working out for a long for a couple weeks, all of a sudden, I'm glad. Really? Well, I'm sorry for that. No wonder the drop them off. It's not me because I'm, I'm enthralling myself even. So it's just a tip. Oh, that doesn't sound better. Can we take this one off then, Kenny? Here. I shut it. Oh, you did? There you go. Sorry for the hiccup. That technology thing. I tell you what, we had a very famous author present to us. Garden Center. She just has a new book called Nature Fix. Florence Williams, Nature Fix. She's really good at it. It's a good book. She's a great writer. She writes for National Geographic, New York Times, that kind of stuff. But she wrote a book on why nature is kind of half science, half uh, research, half why do we feel better when we're in the forest and garden. They actually have hard science on this now. And she's reporting that hard science. The book's just out called Nature Fix by Florence Williams. It's, if you're a gardener sitting here, you would like it. I just finished it on the plane. It's really exceptional. Um, anyway, where was I going? So we were at flowering. What are the flowering trees? I had one more. Oh, the, the, uh, I had the desert willow. It's a desert willow. And the uh, purple leaf one. There's a whole bunch of them. Again, you'll have the list. How's that for volume? Better? Let's see. Is that better? Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. I see a pretty in my ears or whatever. Okay. I, I'm kind of a loud talker. Anyway, I think it's carried pretty well. But anyway, um, those are hearing aids online. Okay. I'm a loud talker. Anyway, I think it's carried pretty well. But anyway, those are hearing aids online. So you'll have that list here. The uh, blooming trees are a lot of places. We do blooming trees very well. Most blooming and fruiting trees. They need to go dormant in the winter to rest. Then they'll form those flower buds and then just come out. And they just go, I'm gonna blow. And then they start to leave. So uh, probably the, the one that I would look at, it's not up here, would be a Bradford pear, ornamental pears. They that white flower in spring. What about aristocrat? What's that? Aristocrat pear? Aristocrat. The capital, Bradford, they're all the same. They do really well. Uh, white flowers, they're the last tree to turn red in the fall of the year. So about Thanksgiving time, they're starting to color. And then once they turn, they shed their leaves, it's over. So it's kind of winter is here. That's when your evergreens take off. The evergreens I've got here, this one. Come on. Thank you. So junipers get a bad rap. 
because our native junipers are such allergy problems. Uh, it's the native ones that cause the allergies, not these. We bred most of the pollen out of these. But native junipers just naturalize so well here. They're just consistent, methodical. You can abuse them, they still live. They're just great for decades and decades and decades to come. Long of, and you can get a lot of different colors of so greens, you know, grays, you know, blues, lots of choices. You can know, get short ones, tall ones, medium ones. Now, this one happens to be Wichita blue, the, the which is a great kind of Arizona blue these. color. It looks like an Arizona cypress, but not. It's a juniper. There's some deer don't eat this. It's so low nice. like bugs and bugs on them. It's a great plant. Uh, so for me, in my front yard, I've got this beautiful courtyard. It's got water fountains and art. It's real pretty. I love going out in the morning to do my coffee. Uh, but you know, you don't want to be in your PJs, sip a coffee in your front yard, and neighbors are going back and forth. Hey, kid, how are you doing? You just feel a little like conscious. So I planted some some spark junipers, which is the same plant as this, only it's green. And I just zigzag in my front, and all of a sudden, no more neighbors. Leave it later. No more neighbors. I mean, I see them when they come, come by the mailbox, but then they're kind of leaving the water. It's, it's, it's just different. Hummingbirds are on the area. This is probably the biggest bowl that someone asked about this giver, Cedar. Who asked about this? Oh, the juniper, that's going to get up in that um, 15 by 6, 7 feet, maybe 8 feet if it's really happy. It's a big, tall, kind of Christmas tree like that. It has a central leader. Not really so much swooping branches, more more central leader, full. And it'll be thick like privacy screens. We use that for privacy screens. This is the fastest growing of all of the evergreens. This is called Deodor Cedar. It looks innocent, but it's a beast. It will take over an entire yard. It's not you plant this in the wrong place, you'll curse this in five, six, seven years. So this is 60 foot tall by 25 feet wide. Huge swooping branches that come down. It's just magnificent. And it's put in the right place. It's pretty stunning. So we're using a lot of these to replace the, the uh, Leland Cypress. So Leland Cypress, has, for many, many years, that was a top seller for us. We've, we've lined driveways, properly lined, big green plant, 25 feet tall, by 12 feet wide. We screen things out. Well, we've got a, a canker that's on there. There's a disease that's going through them, and it's obliterating all Leland Cypress. Higher road. There's nothing you could do. Once they start dying, there's no stopping it. There's no cure. And we're predicting all the Leland's will be dead within the next few years. There's nothing you can do. Birds carry it. It's just a monoculture disease that they're out. We're replacing them with these. Uh, so, because this doesn't have any of those diseases, it grows in the same soil. That, that tinker won't carry it over. And it grows, fills in fast. So, it'll grow three, four feet a year, just poof. It just has a leader, it goes so fast. Just goes to the moon and then has big swooping branches coming off. The Deodor Cedar is a good choice. Uh, just don't put it by the driveway. Don't put it by your neighbor's property line where just all of a sudden they have 12 feet of their property disappear because of your tree. They'll be agitated. You've got to make sure you're kind of watching where you, where you place them. Don't put them right in your front yard as a, as a specimen. Because it'll be that no one will ever see your house in five years, no one will see your house. They'll just see this tree. And that's not why you build a house. You use it to accent the frame. So this is probably not a front yard tree, it's more of a more of a backyard kind of tree, fence line kind of stuff. This is super draw hardy. Yeah, I would say once it's up to size, once you again, I like to fertilize and water things. So I would put this on my drip system until it got to the size I wanted. And I just bend that thing back, and I wouldn't water it again, and I'd, I'd probably reduce the fertilizing maybe once a year. But while it's while it's it doesn't look it doesn't look big, it needs to be in the ground. And once it's in the ground, you get these big branches that just quadruples in size. I mean, within two years, it's going to be five times the size and wide. Like you're not seeing through it. In fact, I used to climb some of these. Oh yeah, Taylor Head School, something like Taylor Head School, I think. Because some, they had some big ones, you could climb it. So it's a perfect scaffolding that terrifies mothers as kids go up, you know, 40 feet up to the top of this thing. They're huge. The Anyways, the top solder. This one, I won't move it because it's so big. 
This is an Arizona cypress. Again, another native. Uh, it grows wild. So you go down towards Kirkland, some of the 4,000 foot level, it's just, you see forests of these just growing. They're not junipers, they're Arizona cypress. Now the difference, the way I can only tell, is they kind of look similar. Um, the junipers put on little blueberries on them, up and down the stems. This one puts on a little tiny pine cone. It's a bigger, almost looks like a berry. You can tell, oh, it's a pine cone, a little close. They're about that big. So that's the only real difference. Again, central leader, straight from the moon, big swooping branches. That's going to get about 20, 22, something like that, by about 12 feet wide. Can we use these for screen wind breaks out in Paulden, not on the valley areas where that wind just comes and tears you up? We'll put those on that southwest side, blocks that wind right out. A, a traffic dust and up and down your road, but that keeps the dust down. It's big enough to actually cut the noise, cut the dust, so strategic ways. And then once you get up to size, never have to water it again and so forth. They'll just take care of itself. Deer don't eat it. Just a consistent, good, strong plant for deer. So this is probably the number one Christmas tree. Just while we're looking at bloom trees, blue, Arizona blue, this is Colorado spruce. Uh, a lot of the California, they don't know what it's called. They just go the one that looks like a Christmas tree. That's this one. Okay. Spruce do really well. There's some very ancient ones, 100 year old trees here. They were planted way back, and they have not been cared for in forever. So you got spruce mountain. This guy, right there, that kind of color fur. Those two grow together side by side. But the upper ridge, ridge lines, they're growing wild. Here in the valleys, uh, out there, they'll grow really well. They might be a little bit more dependent on you with some water if you get this long drop period. But generally, they'll go by themselves. They're, they're used to our water cycles and that kind of stuff. This is going to grow big. It's going to go 50 feet by 20 feet wide. It's a big tree. Slow. So this is last year's growth. You see, what is that, 8 inches or so? So if you really juice them with some fertilizer, maybe you get a foot out of them. Maybe a foot. I've seen a foot and a half. That's really generous, the perfect soil, perfect fertilizing, perfect water, perfect. They grow a lot more. Generally, your backyard is not perfect growing environment for plants. You have to modify some things. We'll get to that in a second. But spruce. Now you get into I like green or I like blue. Pick the color spruce. They're all good. It doesn't matter. And then you get into size. Thanks for coming. Oh, I thought you went back to ball to the uh, dog park. Ah! You betcha. You betcha. Uh, then you get to different sizes. So this is a Colorado spruce, I'm pretty sure. No, 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 it's a fat Albert spruce. This is a dwarf. It's a it gets only mid-teens size, but it looks like a traditional Colorado spruce. Colorado goes to 50, this goes no more than 18 or so. Maybe 20 if it's there forever. You, you and I will long be gone by then, but Maybe you can get down there, but it's a good front yard size tree. By the driveway kind of tree. By the patio, it's not going to overgrow its space. There's a Colorado, that's going to be a big boy. It's going to be three times the scale. Uh, but yes. How big a round will that get? Oh, about 12 feet. Yeah. Okay, good, good question. That great light. You just want to put little Christmas balls on it. Um, this is one that we use often. Uh, we'll load up here. We're starting to harvest those crops now. It's just up at the farm and picking them. Uh, we'll ship those down out of farms out of Salem, Spokane. There's several farms we have up in the Northwest. And we'll ship those down. These are a very popular living Christmas tree. So folks will take these, put them inside, decorate them, put the presents underneath them, and then still plant them. This is on the top of the list for that goes. The great evergreen trees want a Christmas tree like this. It may be too formal for some of you. It's too perfect. We want more natural looking stuff. That's where the Arizona cypress and the junipers are more, they are truly natives. So they put that wild native landscape that you got that goes with hands and needles and that kind of stuff. Uh, and they're pokey. <laughs> can you see this one on camera? Ken, is that okay? Yep. I don't have to move it. Yep. I guess I can move all the product. So pine trees, everyone comes in wanting ponderosa pine. And we, we sell those in the spring. I don't have any right now. Uh, but basically what you're planting is the trunk of the yard. So it has some green up there. You're not really in a tree. 
A better choice would be, a, would be a, a, a Austrian pine. It's a cousin to the ponderosa pine, but it holds its foliage right in the ground. Much better landscape type of plant. And pretty much equally as, tar as tough as hardy. Uh, and, and as fast growing. This is called an Oregon green pine. It's related to Austrian pine. I think they call it an Oregon green um, Austrian pine. The, the needles are just a touch shorter and chubbier. This kind of looks like a good old teddy bear. Anyway, it's straight trunk. Again, these pine trees, they grow straight to the moon, branches coming off to the sides. Now, this is a dwarf. So, Austrian pine is going to get easily 35 feet by 12, 15 feet wide. This guy's going to be half of those dimensions. So, now you can plant it more. It's going to go straight up, the branches come out. Yep, it looks young right now because it is young. My oldest. Oh, does it? Oregon green pine? I don't know if it's an Oregon green pine, but it doesn't have like a So she's got one that's, that's like this. It doesn't oh, use that nice like that. That sounds like a scotch pine. Scotches tend to grow like that. Uh, same as so pinion pine. The pinions, I do have some of the native, native ones that grow wild. I want, I want to go native. And I'll have some of those. In the spring, I'll have some wood. But you gotta be a gardener to grow those. You gotta not overwater, they get bugs galore, or they got scale, bark beetles, a lot of things that get on. And so if you know that, just be aware, be, be proactive with it. And we'll show you what to do with that in a minute. But there's another one called single leaf pinion pine. It doesn't grow native here, but it's a cousin of that. It gets a chubbier leaf. That's the one they get the pinion pine nuts from. That same tree grows here really well, and it does it with the bugs. We tend to sell, we tend to talk people into way more of those just for care and maintenance and servicing down the road than the native, but I'll sell both. So if it's some, a native person just wants, that's what they want. So we'll have what you want. And then we'll show you how to, and I'll make money off that tree for, for 20 years. So my grandkids need to you know, take care of them too, because you're gonna need to treat them and fertilize and care for them more than you would that's a, a different variety, okay? And I think I just covered, oh, we got fruit, then we got fruit trees. So fruit trees, if you're doing fruit trees, always start with apples or pears. The reason being, they're the last to bloom in spring, so they're much more consistent with their fruiting. You'll almost, every year, you almost count on it. I'm gonna have apples and I'm gonna have pears. Whereas peaches, you'll get about every every third or fourth year they get frozen out because they bloom a month earlier than these guys do and an apricot that's a feast of famine thing about every i don't know every other year they freeze out the apricots are the first one to bloom usually about april one and we still got a month and a half of potential frost so you have to always live in paranoia when the nectarines and apricots are bloom some of the plums not all of them but a few you gotta always be ready to cover them or protect them or keep them from freezing. You know, I have little tiny apricots on them. This is gonna be so good. And then when that last storm comes in the end of March, April, and you're like, dang it, I lost the fruit. So just kind of be able to start with those that are new to the area, new to growing fruit, start with apples and pears, and then add the peaches and the nectarines, the apricots, the, the other stuff. If you want to, and then you'll need help. This is one where you really want to come talk to us. Uh, so we get the right varieties and we get the right pollinators. Some plants need buddies to help them to pollinate. So apples and pears generally need a, need a friend to cross pollinate, and they can't be the same variety. They need to be a Fuji, a honey crisp, or a gold delicious, a yellow yellow delicious, or a, 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 a Macintosh. You need to you need to make sure we line those up. And we've got the expertise to make sure. We have a lot of folks that come in and go, I planted this tree five years ago, never had fruit off of it. I'll tell you why. You didn't have a crop, you didn't, you didn't chart that thing out right. So you need a, need a friend to go with it. We're starting to have more and more and more of the cocktail trees, where we'll plant, uh, we've got one where we plant three or four trees in the same bucket, and they're all cross pollinated with each other. It creates this beautiful, Base shaped fruiting apple tree. 
you pick your, your Fuji's, and when that one's about done, you get your one delicious. When that's done, you get your Granny Smith. Like it, it, it spreads out the, uh, the harvest for you. We're trying to make it easier and easier and easier. It takes some artistry to kind of pull that off, which makes some uh, making sure you put the logistics right with the right varieties. But that's what we do. It's kind of fun for us. You can look for those. I don't think I have any right now, but I've got single single varieties. Uh, but apples and pears. Start with that as my main thing. You want more? I've got a fruit tree book that'll really knock it out of the park for you. How close is the pollinator? Very good. Yeah, very good. How close is the pollinator bee? Need to be by that plant. Uh, the bees will travel any distance, anywhere in the property. Just don't put a barn or a house or sheds between them. The bees are dumb as mud. They just, <laughs> they do not think. They just see it. They just want to travel right to it. They don't go forage. Look this way. They don't want to go straight at it. 100 feet, side by side. Anyone, if your neighbors have one, that'll work. So just make sure it's a line of sight. And I, I find that they pollinate quite well for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What if your fruit trees don't bloom? Okay, that's where if your fruit trees don't bloom, that was a question. What happens then? That means you're getting more desert varieties. You got some that are, that are they're budding. But their their buds are so far so into winter that there's some varieties that like a desert variety, a desert gold apple. It only needs 200 chilling hours to start blooming. It activates in 200, 200, not even cold nights. It's hours. How many? What is that? A month and a half of cold to start to bloom. That's what the desert needs. They need to get that thing fruited and harvested before the summer comes. We want apples that need 1,200 chilling hours. So that'd be an active drop. You get 1,200 uh, honey, honey crisps, 1,000. So now we're programming that so we know it's not going to bloom until April. Now we're out of most of that. But so if you know that, it could be fertilization. Use, use more of it to the wrong variety. We can talk offline and kind of go into deeper details. I would say load it up with fertilizer uh, this fall. We'll go over that in a second. Uh, uh, see if you can get it to set buds for this next spring. If it still doesn't bloom for you, uh, I know we can buy a chainsaw right down the street. Let a dog. We're just enjoying it as a shade tree. It's, just, it's going to be a pretty great fall color. I mean, fruit trees have everything. Blossom, ornamental fruits, fall color. If you don't want the fruit, have a nuisance. You've got rats, chipmunks. you got to clean things up. i got a buddy of mine, beautiful peaches. doesn't want to harvest peaches anymore. So he puts a peach. You put the fruit tree picker right there on, on the boulder with recipes on how to use peaches in the bags. And so neighbors just come by and pick whatever they want. They take care of all of it. It's all gone. So I'm trying to end this thing to serve it. And people want fresh fruit. There's nothing better than a fresh apple of hair plum melted your mouth. Whereas they're pithy and gross in the grocery store. It's hard to find a really good fruit. You can grow those so easily yourself. No citrus, no avocados, unless you take them indoors and that kind of stuff. I think I have a line on dwarfed citrus that I can bring in, Meyer lemons, that kind of stuff. But by Halloween, you got to bring those things indoors. You need an Arizona room or greenhouse or something to protect that to the diamond. Okay. Anyway, let's go over how to plant one of these, shall we? If you don't mind, I'm going to borrow this chair. If you don't mind me just reaching and grabbing it. I'll hold my breath. Sorry about that. So let's just take the easiest one to lift. I'm going to go medium size. Let's go with this one. Let's go with this one. This is good. Oh my gosh. Not good. This is a typical 15 gallon tree. It's probably a top seller for size. This side, you got a big root, and you can grow out this thing. So you can actually get the scaffold inside. The crown of the tree is starting to get large enough. You're going, oh, that's a little tree. By next year, when this thing grows, It'll really look like a tree. So fall is a tremendous time to plant a tree. Probably the ideal time. In fact, I say when, when the monsoons start through about Thanksgiving is kind of the sweet spot. That's when you get the most success. And what you're doing is you're planting now, and it may not grow that much, but it's rooting like crazy. It'll root till the end of the year. And then next spring, it's going to flush twice the growth. That if you were to wait and plant that next spring, 
you wouldn't get nearly as much growth next year as you did if you're, if you're planting now. Uh, the secret is you just have to water it through winter. We'll cover that in a second. We go over how to plant it, and we'll go over how to water it in a second, okay? So when you plant this, this is where Phoenix is a real curse. We do not, sorry about that. Only do truck drivers. I drive a truck too. Anyway, um, this, this uh, the hole only wants to be as deep as the root. Roots do not go down. There is no tap root here. There's nothing down there for them except caliche, boulders, rock, clay. There's nothing for them to go after. Everything they're looking for is at the surface. Uh, rain, afternoon rains, moisture, uh, nutrients are coming at, at the surface. So even big established native plants, they only have a root ball that's down about three feet, but then they go out for hundreds of feet. They spread out like this. If you know that's how trees are going to grow, give them a hole that does that. And so you just go as deep as the bucket, but you're going three times as wide. Saucer shape. That's the hole. When you dig the soil out, put your wheelbarrow in your bucket or off to the side. Uh, you want to screen that dirt, anything that is, is bigger than a golf ball, rocks, debris, and maybe found bricks that the contractor buries in the yard. It reduces cost at the, at the dump yard. Just get all that debris out of there. And what you're left with is, is particles small enough to hold the water molecules. You're trying to get it where it's, it's finer, where the roots can go through it and take advantage of it. When you're done, mix in about one-third mulch to two-thirds native soil, okay? Or about one shovel of, of mulch to three two, three shovels of native soil. Blend that all together. Even if it's a clay? Even if it's a clay. The plant has to get used to that. You want to help it, though. So it's used to this rich, beautiful soil. So we've actually infused this, this soil with mycorrhizal fungi, which is beneficial that attach themselves to the roots and help them grow. So we're doing things to help you. So those mycorrhizal feed off of the organic that you add into the soil. It's also going to bring the worms. All right, that mulch is going to activate the soil. If you replace all of that and just put it with potting soil, more of this, it would grow really fast. Then, then it would just plane out for about five years ago. Oh my gosh, we're out of soil. It wouldn't like to make that transition with rooting too. So we're trying to get it, we're trying to trick it into start rooting out. Look, the soil, I know it just changed, but look, it's okay. Root this way. And so, and, and heavy clay soil, which most of us are dealing with. Um, if you dig that out, filter it, and then water it just once, it goes right back to that heavy clay. So the, the mulch actually keeps it, you're changing the structure of that soil so it can't go right back down to that clay soil. In real sandy soil, of course you get to, to Granite Mountain, you know, like Granite Lake, so there's Granite Mountain. Anywhere around Granite Mountain, it's that crushed granite, it's almost like sand. Well there it holds the water, so it keeps the water from flushing, the nutrients is flushing right to the soil. So it holds it up around so the plant can root out better, stronger, faster. Anyway, point being, take your soil, thin it, pull it, screen it, screen it, get all the chunks out, add some good stuff, some compost. Don't use manure. You folks with horses, you know who you are. Don't use that. That pile is for other purposes, not for planting trees. It's too hot. Use compost and then backfill around that. Now, here's you have heavy clay soil. So if I'm in doubt, if I see white chunks coming up out of the ground, that's caliche. It's like a concrete looking material. It's really bad. And it's that 69 corridor in the whole valley. It was all the way up to Portis Junction. There's heavy caliche layers. If you see that, you're going to have to pet through that because it's like concrete. Water will not penetrate it. And so what you just dug is a big bathtub. So if we see that with a jackhammer or a digging bar, it's real easy to get through it. Usually it's a layer. Anywhere from two, three inches to seem up to a foot or so, but it's a definite band. You just got to get through the band. And it doesn't have to be through the entire hole, just a piece of it. We call that digging a chimney. Uh, so, so do that if you see, see big, if you're afraid it might not drain, look for that. And then there's the ultimate test. Fill the hole up in the morning. If water is still sitting there later that afternoon, you don't want to plant there yet. You still want to modify that hole. 
It's just it's not perking fast enough. So if you're on septic fields and you're always checking the perk before you put the septic line in, um, well, you might need to check the perk for your plants. Uh, another old trick, and it's just, my name's Ken, we're just friends, we're just like backyard things, we're just talking. This will work for me. So my first house was in Prescott Valley. That was some really hard, I killed a lot of plants learning how to grow things out there. So the heavy clay soil, like when you walk on it when it's raining, like you grow because it sticks to the bottom of your feet, it's really bad. Uh, rocks just emerge out of the mud, and the muck and mire just start floating. I don't know where they come from, they just emerge. It's really hard gardening. Uh, do not plant, I guess plant at least at soil level, do not plant below grade. Don't put it in a divot. That's sure doom for that plant. Um, that's a Phoenix thing. That's when you're living 10 miles from the sun, and it's 105 out at midnight. Who lives down there? That's crazy. Yeah, you can do that. They also see no rain. So here, we don't want to fill that butt, that hole up. We actually want it to drain so that water goes away from the roots. You want it to go away from your house so the footers start working on you. You want it to go away from the roots so that the roots can breathe. So if they sit in the water, they'll root off. They call it root rot. The roots will literally root off. The circle root gets stuck in water and just rots off. You can go backwards in time if it gets too wet. And the monsoon season, when that's, when that's going to happen. You have a couple of tripping meters on there, and then you have some afternoon rains a couple times that, that uh, week, and all of a sudden, that plant is too wet for a couple of weeks, and it doesn't take very long. How long does it take for your feet to get shriveled up and, and get crinkly if you leave in the water too long? Flowers doesn't take long. Simple roots. You want them to be able to breathe. Um, there at Prescott Valley, it's really heavy clay. I actually started to leave a couple inches of root of, of the root ball out of the ground. And then I was slightly mound up to that root ball to guarantee, no matter what, at least that much of the root ball could breathe. This is a game changer. The mortality rate just dropped to almost nothing. With that, with that whole trick, I think that'll help you. That doesn't matter how you get real heavy clay, you know, granny soil, but heavy clay, you're not sure about it, kind of test it. Water's still sitting there at the end of the day, you got a problem, you go to the bathtub, or I would say don't plant, no, even with that technique, if water's still sitting there, don't plant in a hole that just doesn't drain. Uh, there you talk a raised bed, if you pick the lock, you really about I would say dig a hole, try to dig a chimney, and a portion of that hole, we'll see if you can get to the next soil band. Usually the next soil band, you'll see the texture change, all the sudden it'll start draining, and that plant will just take off as the growth for it. Okay? Yeah. So, will gypsum help with the draining? So, if you read the bag on gypsum, the bag on gypsum says liquefied rock. Make all things drain. It doesn't do that at all. No, it doesn't help. What gypsum really does is uh, that that white buildup you see in your sink, that, that, that ring in the toilet, uh, that, that builds up in the soil too. And it clogs up the pores in the soil. What gypsum does, you put that on, it helps to flush that heavy mineral buildup out of there. But if you haven't been watering that area, and you haven't had with that, with the drip system going on, you know, twice a week for two hours, you get this, you get this layer of it clogs up the soil. It helps to flush that out. If you have the water in there, you don't have that yet. Will it help you in the future? It can. But I think if you blend that soil mulch, soil mixture, that is way more effective than adding some gypsum. Your contractors, which they are not the sharpest people in case you're wondering. They didn't own a pickup truck and a shovel and they got started in their business. They don't know plants necessarily. They recommend that a lot. When I sell them gypsum galore, I don't think for my friends, I'd say invest in, in the mulch. That's probably better. Okay. Test the soil. When I get all done, I'm going to sprinkle the recommended amount. You'll have this handout your way pretty quick uh, this afternoon. I'll take this all purpose food and I'll sprinkle that. This is what's going to fertilize it. Feed it for the next 90 days. So it's long. it just keeps it rooted, keeps it going. Keep them getting yellow. This helps it grow more. So when a new plant, you just need as much growth as you can that first year. Just get the roots out, get the top growth. How often can it 
just once, one time. Yep, we're trying to make it easy. One time, some organic food slowly. I can go into details on what this is, but this. Trying to do this. And then I water it in the root and grow. This is going to go into transplant here and get it. I don't think you see that label as much. Is that okay for the folks online? But you can put those again that handouts on your in your comment box, download it right there. Uh, this is a compost tea. So we've taken some, some organic stuff, boiled it, processed it, and it looks kind of like molasses. Uh, it has an earthy kind of smell, but plants a lot of this stuff. So it helps it to start rooting and taking off. The best house plant food you'll ever find. They, they just love, love this. But it's made for transplant shop. You, you'll get, I'll, I'll do this every two weeks. Uh, I'll add some of this to my, my plantings until I see the plant stabilize. You go, oh, it's good. look, new leaves. Oh my gosh, that's great. You'll know when it's, when it's taking. And I'll never do with this again. Now I want the fertilizer take over. So mulch, food, root and grow. Those are three things whenever you plant, you're gonna need, but especially for trees. If you're in a windy area, you want some ridge lines and stuff, it gets really windy, especially in the spring, that, that southwest prevailing wind, uh, the trees will start to lean on you to the northeast. There you, you might need to put a stake on. We sell stake kits. It's Two lodge poles, tie it once. You just want to keep it upright without leaning. Uh, but there's a technique and that'll be in that handout too. So if you need help with that, you know, it's more more isolated, more protected. You probably don't need it. it just depends on where you're at. Okay. If you're buying a tree and that stake is right up against the trunk, so we 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 shift the trees from the farm with that because it keeps them from being damaged. We take them off when they're here because we don't want you to plant that. We know a lot of trees we planted with that. What it causes is a, is a real weak trunk. And so you, you want it to be able to move, but not lean. And so you don't want to stick next to this. You want it outside and then tie once or twice from the side of the tree. Let it let it flow and move. That creates a strong tree. Uh, are a lot of these trees deer proof? No. And yes, if that's a deer or your nemesis, Caucus and tell you what you want. Here, don't like evergreens generally. Uh, we can we can talk offline. Say which one? Yeah, was your question over here? Got it. Hey, can yeah. can I make a comment real sure. quick? I noticed you guys were feverishly writing all this down as Ken went through this. Yeah. For those of you that get our garden column, if you don't, you should. He did a video about two weeks ago yeah. about planting. Yeah. Now, it was butterfly bush, but the techniques are the same. Yeah. So if you're looking for a refresher, it's in this week's uh, garden column, and it's also up on our YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah so, so for you folks online, so it's going pretty fast. I've only got an hour, so I'm running out of time. I'm already out of time. I want to go over the test before we do anything in food. That won't take very long. Uh, but, but check online on our website under the blog. In this week's garden call, we had embedded a YouTube video on how to plant. If I did it with a butterfly brush, it's the same. Whatever you're planting, it's always the same. So look for that if you need more. Okay, let's go over food, just because we've already touched on that. So what you'll find is our soil has no food. You're going to have to fertilize more often. And if you're thinking of holidays, think of, if you start in spring, Easter, you should fertilize in Easter, on Easter, not in Easter, on Easter, uh, the 4th of July or Independence Day. It's usually right as the rains come. We're going to fertilize right then. And you get a tremendous uptake that way. Uh, we're coming up on to Halloween. It's the most important feeding of the entire year is Halloween. It's using that food, that food to form next year's flower buds for fruit trees or leaf buds, it's using that food to flush next spring's growth. You're always a season ahead. And then for evergreens, I find if you fertilize at the New Year's since it's spring, but it, you're notorious for winter porosis. But yet the uh, beetle seeds turn yellow. You can tell which neighbors just fertilize. Because they'll get this off color to them. You fertilize right then, they stay green, they're vibrant, they'll give you something healthy to look at. 
in the even on the darkest of days in January, it really keeps you going. And you're using this food every time. So you don't have to get, you do make this food, it's kind of meal and bird guano, and sulfur and iron, it's got a bunch of fairy dust, you mix everything you want in here. Uh, but one food for all of your feeding. You should fertilize perennials, grass, trees, shrubs, evergreen, fruit trees, one, one food. So the industry tries to make it really confusing. At one point I was selling, I think, eight different fertilizers. I had fruit tree food, I had pansy food, geranium food, evergreen food, hydrangea and holly food, ridiculous. It's, it, they just want you to buy more food. That's all they're doing. Just be, find a good food, be consistent, and that, that's good enough. Organics are better in that they, they break down slower and the plants pick up more of it and it lets it wash away. I would encourage you to stay away from synthetic fertilizers. That's your Scots and clean pig, orthos, big names. It's like white sulfide stuff, ammonium sulfate is most common. It's so liquid. When the second water hits it, rain hits it, it, it liquefies and goes down the stream. We're drinking half of it when it starts to recycle into the water to shed. We're trying to get people off of synthetics and back on organic because these don't do that. And it's a bit more of it anyway. I get on my soapbox on that one, but it's important for us because we're all drinking well water. That's just the way we are. Uh, bugs to watch for. The number one I wanted to point out on your evergreens, really protect those. I won't go into every kind of bug that's every kind of tree. I've got a whole class on that. I don't have time. The main thing I want to leave you with is your your natives, your evergreens are in danger. They get there's a scale that gets on them, and there's a part of several different beetles, uh, boring type beetles that go in the trunk. Uh, especially your natives, ponderosas, pinion pines, but they also migrate over to scotch. It's, I've seen them on spruce. I've seen them on every, all the evergreens. So for my evergreens, I put this on at least once a year. It's a plant protector. And you don't have to be an arborist to do this. You can just mix it up in your own five gallon bucket. We pour it right at the base of the tree. The plant absorbs it underneath the bark. And then it protects that, that, that tree, the cambium layer, just underneath the bark is what they're after. It's real sweet, high carbohydrate kind of, kind of wood softer wood, um, they're after that. They eat that and they finally girdle the tree and it dies. And it so the hips die out. There's all kinds of stuff that happens. And because we have so many naturally occurring evergreen forests that flow through here, we have more of those bugs that show up to like evergreen. Do this once a year uh, and, and it'll, it'll, it'll permeate through that wood band, that ring, and protect it. So you can do it. If you haven't done it yet, do it now. Generally, I say do it in spring when that new growth is coming, like March, April is the idea. But if you haven't done it, you get a brand new home, and there's a few you built the house around your pinion pine or, or that ponderosa. Some of, you, some of the homes are built around the trees. If you lose them, there's no recovery. Protect those. Containers, less important. So, her question is can I use this in containers? Mainly it's for in the ground stuff, less so. Mainly because container gardens, you're gardening with containers, you're cared for them all. You can just react, you're right there in your face. You're able to recover, you probably spit a couple light organics and fun. Out in the yard out there, they're the ones at more risk, I find. So, yes. So, I need to use that on my native cedars? Do I need to use it on my native universe native cedars? If you've seen stress, so this year I said yes. Because the drought, we were seeing a lot of dieback. In fact, a lot of them just died, they flat out died. So we did see them attack more than usual. Generally, no. But some years, you know, we were we were drought for two years, and now we aren't. Well, the winter hole, well, I've seen it where it's done this, and we've been dry for three or four months, just through winter. So we need that snowpack through the winter to really come out of this healthy. So kind of monitor, do your gardener thing, your, your gardener, your regular, kind of watch it monitor. If in doubt, yes, especially an old one. So I find also younger ones, they're more, they're less prone to problems, but that's way kids are. You know, they're actively growing, they might get sick, but they get, they recover like that. The old guys, I get sick, it takes me forever to recover. You want to keep them protect, them healthy, that, you want to watch out for them. 
and they're the ones that are valuable. So, yeah. What's going on with the plums this year? I see a lot of dead ones. I have three in my yard. One of them is yeah. Is it because we have so much snow left? Yeah, so what happened? So our question was, for you folks online, a plum, and not just plums, it's quite a few different yes, trees. Yes. Um, they're struggling this year. They're not as vibrant as they have been in the past. I think what happened, I think that's drought damage. We've seen a lot of that come in. Yes. We went for so long with no moisture. We're just starting to become a distant memory, thank goodness. We've got enough moisture the last few months. But that damage takes could take another season to recover. So it might take more root growth. Here. What happened was the roots dried up and died off. So the drip system that you have on that tree is good, good supplement. But during drought, that's not enough. You need native natural rain to supplement your drip system. Your drip system is supplementing nature. Nature, it can't do it by itself, especially for trees that have big, large root nests. So that's not enough unless you really tune up that drip system and, and adjust it to, to protect more of the root ball, which we generally don't do, you're seeing that drought stress. So for you, for that tree especially, there's a product down there called Humic, H-U-M-I-C. Again, it's a granular. It's humic acid. I would put that on to those stressed out trees at the same time I'm fertilizing with the all purpose tree. But the food actually feeds the top growth. Humic it feeds the bottom of the roots. Actually encourages it to trim all that dead stuff off. Yeah. Anytime you see dead wood on any plant, cut it out of there. Because it is just like a magnet for disease. If you want more bugs, just have a couple dead branches and you're going to have them. Because they come in to harvest and to uh, scavenge, to, to, to cut out bugs or maybe get rid of that, that dead wood. And then if it's if you're not careful, quickly migrate to the to the good wood. So apples, trees, whatever, get rid of dead wood is not good. On um, manzanita or anything. Yeah. yeah, you'll do your shaping in the winter. Like a whole class on pruning. We don't want to go there. Most of pruning on these trees are done in the winter, January, February, March. That's when you're pruning most of them. Not your spring blooming. Spring blooming like lilac, and persithia, the, the, the azaleas, things that bloom in the spring, you let them, you let them bloom, then you cut them back or shape them. Otherwise, you can, cut them, you can cut them in winter, but then you're cutting all the flowers off. And then you get these funky, you, you know which ones we cut wrong because all the lilac that blooms only coming out the sides. All the top growth is gone because the, the landscape will came in again. They're not the brightest. Anyway. They just come back because they're deficient on labor is what they're after. You kind of watch that one. So, yeah. Good questions, actually. Good time to plant. You have permission. So, all my, all my California folks are going, four seasons. I don't know. It's going to be just below 80 degrees. I don't know if I can plant now. No, it's a good time. You're fine. You're, it's a good time. Sorry. I'm a California kid. Old but small apple tree. Had a rough life. So, when I moved in, I tried yeah. to help it, but it got blister burn. Gotcha. Guy told me I'll give it three years. It's been three years, and the whole thing is dead. Yeah. But it's got a lot of shooters coming. Yeah. If I cut that off, will the shooters get the blister bark too? No. So here's what he had. Just uh, he had an old tree that had blistering bark, and he's tried for three years to get this thing to grow, and now it's dead. Suckers are coming up. What should they do? Will they grow? Yes, they will grow, and they will never be a desirable fruit. Tree. It will never it'll be below the graph to be something wild. It would be probably a crab apple, probably. It will come up. And so if you like crab apples, go for it. Personally, I think, yeah, it's green, but you're laying you have this you know, half million million dollar home and, and you have the good things in there. That's why we invented chainsaws <laughs> and a bumper and a chain. Just get that dog out of there. It puts a, for 50 bucks, I've got an apple tree with it for $10 to get a pick home. I do it now. You can call it. You got ugly things. You garden me. I've got medication for you all. Yeah, but you're trying to keep this thing that should have died three years ago alive. That's a gardener. You're a gardener. Uh, no, I own a garden center, so I'm very biased. But I don't let anything ugly in my garden. This is made for beauty, it's made for therapy, it's made for 
butterflies, hummingbirds. They should be beautiful, not struggling and ugly. Dig that dog out of there. Here's a story, and I'll leave you with this. I nearly killed my twin daughters once. They're on video. <laughs> I know. So I moved into my house. So we, we bought a pre existing house up in Eagle Ridge. And roses are right there. Stupid place. Right there where the hose pit is. It's a road right from the hose. That's stupid. And so uh, these roses have got to go. I don't want roses next to the house anyway. I want something nice. Not, they belong out here. I have a lot of roses, but not right there. And so I tied up a, a rope. I didn't have a chain. I kind of tried to dig it a little bit. Well, now I'm going to see what happens. I got 600 horsepower on this truck. I could make this baby come out of the ground. Well, I didn't know. I didn't realize that rope stretches. And so it stretched and created a catapult effect. And so this plant started to leap out of the ground. My daughter, twin daughters, are now like in the late 20s, back when they were far younger. And uh, that thing started coming out and came right between them. We're talking a big rose bush. To, to rip these two girls a new one, they would have been scarred for life. Uh, but their mother was gone, so didn't see it, so I was lucky. Uh, she, she dragged me, she drove me like five minutes later. So uh, went right between them. They had no idea. Oh, Dad, such a good gardener. That really killed you. So, but rope does take even roses out of the ground. They're very deep roots. And I think it takes out four chains that you know, doesn't stretch. It just kind of holds it right up. Go with chains. Chains are the roots. So it doesn't have to stretch. Generally not. It's going to go down and go out like this. You can tear a little bit. Or a sawzall. Sawzall is the greatest with a longer blade. That's the greatest thing ever. Greatest invention. Oh, you could do that. Train one. Don't leave the shoots. Take one that you like. Train it to go up. Do that. So put all that energy into one sucker. Otherwise, it'll be this funky, weird, disease-ridden thing. Yeah. Anyway, that'd be my recommendation. But you don't have to listen to me. So anyway, anything else? We're all set. We've got an hour and 15. So thanks so much. You're the last question. So locusts, what you're seeing is a cycle changing right now. So we're, we're, we're fading out of the summer mix. It's a summer, late spring summer mix. So I have some beautiful red locusts. They're, they're like they're like a, a Mother's Day bloomer. with a great big wisteria kind of walks into them. I'll load up for, for Mother's Day in every size, every shape, as many as I can get. Because they'll all be gone by the end of May. Because they're so pretty around the town. So that's probably the ideal time to plant those. Uh, uh, golden locust is more of a summer thing. It's a beautiful shade tree. So, so I'll, I'll have those. That's why I keep track of our website. And you'll see it before we even see it. So as it comes in the back dock, before it's even in stock, you'll see that it's here. It's kind of a problem, actually. You've got to slow down that purchase order process. So wait till they're in stock before we upload the website. That's that's top ten trees.com. That'll show you. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Well, you all, I'll uh, kind of clap for yourselves. You got all done. You can plant. I don't hang out. If you got some more questions or come look at the trees. Just because uh, of the air. Um, yeah, I have a favorite right here. Yeah.